Well, good morning, Spring Lake family. So good to see you this morning. If you're joining us online, welcome to you as well. If you are visiting with us, welcome. We're so glad you're here. My name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And this morning, we are wrapping up our series through the letter of 1 Corinthians, series we've entitled Messy Church, as it is a church that had a lot of mess. Just like many of us, there can be messy times in our lives or messy situations we find ourselves in. Paul was writing these believers to deal with the mess that they were dealing with. And just a little review, as we've looked at this letter, throughout the letter, we have seen incredible encouragement from Paul given to these believers in Corinth. And we've also seen some really important admonishment some correction that he's given. We've seen the danger of sin left unchecked, and we've seen the beauty of grace that is centered on the cross of Jesus Christ by which we receive God's forgiveness and grace. There are warnings and reminders. There is deep theology and practical application. And at the heart of all of our transformation is what Jesus has done for us through his life, death, and resurrection, the means by which we have hope. In other words, that we're not just here to get inspired to take on another day. We have hope because we have a Savior who has overcome. He's the reason why we continue to gather together. The reason why we're here is there is a Savior who loves us, who came to rescue us and offer eternal life with him. Think about that. I mean, that's pretty incredible. The fact that we have a God who loves us so much. Now, as we wrap up the letter in chapter 16, there is seemingly this flurry of activity as Paul closes out his letter. And perhaps you've heard it many times before said that church is not a spectator sport. Right? It's not just a place to sit on the bench. It's not meant to be something that is simply observed. Uh, after all, we've seen even through this letter that in chapter 12, every follower of Jesus has been given a gift to be used for the building up of the church, for the encouragement of one another, to add to the church by more people coming to Christ through the testimony of other followers of Jesus. We've seen through chapter 13, the fuel for using those gifts is love. The love being a key part because without love, we have nothing. In fact, in John, in 1 John, he talks about how love for one another is evidence that we truly know God. That if we are not loving to one another, we're actually deceived, we're actually blinded and still living in darkness. So love being a key component to what it looks like to do life together, to live out as God's people with one another. Now as we wrap up this letter, it can kind of seem like the end credits of a movie. Right? Have you ever found yourself reading through some of these letters in the New Testament and you kind of start reading through and you kind of get to the bulk of it and then all of a sudden at the end, it seems like it's just a bunch of names and you kind of skip over that part because who watches the end credits of a movie, right? I mean, unless it's a Marvel movie and there's an extra scene that you're waiting around for. Otherwise, who cares who the key grip is, right? And who cares who the caterer was? But their names are there. I know for me, I found it quite amazing a few years ago when I was watching a Marvel movie sitting through and all of a sudden I saw my name in the credits. I had nothing to do with the movie, but it was just cool to see my name there. But as we look at the wrap up of this letter, what we see is it's worth reading. There are various examples for us to learn from as to what it means to live as a church, as to what it means to love one another and to look out for one another. And not only those that are in the midst of Spring Lake Church, our local community here, but also other believers in other places, other opportunities for the gospel of Jesus to be proclaimed and shared. 
So having said that, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 16 this morning. You can follow along on the Bible app if you have that downloaded on your phone. You can follow along in uh, a regular book Bible if you'd like one of those. We have those in English or in Spanish at the back of the room. I invite you to jump up and go grab, well, you don't have to jump. Don't hurt yourself, okay? But they're in the back of the room. They're free if you want to grab one of those. I said last night, I still have not seen anyone like do that. I'm like, when that happens, I've always said, hey, we're not going to embarrass you. Just go grab one. I'm going to like get really excited when I see somebody do that. Okay, so just if, if you need a Bible, they're in the back of the room. If you would like one of those, they're on the screens for you as well this morning. 1 Corinthians 16. Before we jump in, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this letter and for its relevance to our lives. Thank you for its truth. And God, the honest truth is this morning, we don't need just to hear a bunch of opinion this morning. We get plenty of that every day. What we need is to hear from, from you. We need to hear authoritative truth. And so God, we pray that as we open up your word, help us to understand, help us uh, to know what it is that you are saying. And God, help us to live accordingly, in honor of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 1 Corinthians 16, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit, I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I'm expecting him along with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go, with, to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts of Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you, for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at, your, at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus Amen. Probably heard it said, no man is an island and no follower of Jesus is an island either. No church, no local church is an island either. Every local church is a part of the big C church, part of the whole. And here in the midst of everything that the Corinthians had been getting wrong, Paul has been correcting them and reminding them that they are a part of the whole. And with that comes opportunities. With that comes responsibilities. There are two commitments that we're going to look at through this chapter. 
One of those commitments is just through the examples that we see laid out continually throughout the entire chapter. The other one is going to be more of an overt statement, an overt commitment that we are to make. The first one being commit to being involved. Commit to being involved. As I said earlier, there's a lot happening in this chapter. There's lots of examples, lots of names that we can look to, these different people that are mentioned by name who are serving. People like Timothy, Apollos, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaicus, Aquila, and Priscilla. If anyone is pregnant and looking for ideas... There's some right there. there. There's a variety of places mentioned. Not only is there Corinth that he is addressing here, but there's Galatia, Jerusalem, Macedonia, Ephesus, and Achaia. So it appears with everything that has been happening, we're continuing to see what's been happening even in the book of Acts, that the church is about sending and going it's about sending people for the purpose of making Christ known. We see the activity where there are needs to be met, people to teach and encourage and work to be done. One thing that's for sure, and this is something that we even have to challenge our own mindset with, is that church is not boring. Church is not boring because it's the place where we see the hand of God at work and the lives and through the lives of people. And there may be, may, be, may be moments where it's like, man, you haven't had my experiences. Church can be pretty boring. Church is boring when we lose sight of who God is and what he is doing. Sometimes maybe it's that church is boring because we're not close enough to the action where we're just observing from too far away when we're not participating in the work that God is doing. How can it be boring to see God doing a work that is gonna last for all of eternity in the lives of his people? To see God's hand at work, and we're called to be participants in that. Not simply observers, not simply armchair quarterbacks, not just opinionated people about how things should be run or how they should be going, but to be actively involved in what God wants to do. Think about that. that the creator of the universe invites you not only to be a part of his family, but to be doing a work that is going to have an eternal impact on other people. It's an incredible opportunity to know people, to hear their stories, to pray for one another, to share requests with one another, to learn from one another, to cry out together in the desperate moments of the heart, to walk beside one another through thick and thin, pointing to the hope of Jesus. Last Monday night, I had the opportunity to meet with various life group leaders that were just sharing what God has been doing in and through their groups. And it was this mutual edifying time for all of those leaders there. As we were hearing about the transformation taking place, as one leader shared about some, some key moments that he's been seeing in some of the people in his group where they are really releasing their view of how they look at, world, at the world in themselves and just embracing what God has for them. Some real life change happening. And what we have here at Spring Lake, one of the key opportunities for us to do life together is through life groups. Because we can't possibly know each other intimately in these moments. Our gatherings here, it's important for us to come together and we worship God who is so worthy and we sit under the teaching of his word, but we can't possibly really know each other regularly. You might see me up here and oh yeah, that's the pastor that spits a lot when he talks. But we don't really know each other. Life groups provide that opportunity to engage and do life together, to study God's word together, to serve together, to pray together, to go through those moments together where we are encouraging one another. And Paul is revealing multiple ways to be involved in the life of the church. Just looking at chapter 16, we're going to pop up a slide that's just going to show you the different ways just from this chapter 
just from the examples that we see in this chapter, various ways to be involved. One of those is simply is just hosting, inviting people into your home. Maybe inviting a life group to be hosted in your place. It's a reminder that as followers of Jesus, we're not just to look to our own needs, we're to look to one another. We see that throughout this chapter. And as a church also, we don't simply look to the needs of our own body. There are various ways for us to be involved and to be active in the life of the church, to be ministering to one another and for the greater good. So as we look at these opportunities that we see just through this chapter, I just wanna take some time this morning just to talk through a couple of those. First one we see in the beginning of the chapter is Paul's instructions on taking up a collection for the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. And we see what he says there beginning in verse one. Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. The first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I'll give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. See, the, the church in Jerusalem was struggling. There was a famine that was happening, and with that came economic hardship. So Paul was going around, and he was encouraging churches. He was encouraging followers of Jesus to take care of other followers of Jesus that were having a really hard time. And he's encouraging them that as they gather, come and, and bring something. He's not, he's not trying to twist their arm. He's not trying to manipulate emotions. He's simply stating, hey, there is this need and the solution to the need is not a government program. He's saying as the church, as followers of Jesus, he's encouraging them to give, not guilting them into doing something simply stating the need and encouraging them in giving in proportion to their income. And he even wants to make it clear that, hey, he is not the one that's personally going to be receiving the money, okay? He doesn't want any idea like, oh, you know, Paul's just skimming off the top. Here he is, he's just buying a really nice camel to take around, you know, one of those with like the heated seats and everything else. Paul is just like wanting this plush lifestyle. No, Paul's not doing that. He's like, hey, pick some guys that you trust, pick some guys that you know, have them take the money to Jerusalem. If, if it's necessary, I'm a part of it, I'll go. But the biggest issue for Paul was, hey, we need to take care of one another. We need to take care of the family of God. And it's a model for us to how we give today. To, to how we give when we say, hey, there's ways to give. There's the silver boxes at the door. There's giving online. It's not under compulsion. It's saying, hey, these funds are used for the ministry. It's used to bless people. It's used to equip people. It's used to send people out. It's a model that we see here for how we're to give, not under compulsion, but in line with what God has given us, what God has laid on our hearts in proportion to our income. We are called to give and we're called to send. We see here that Paul is not only asking them to give, but to send out. It's not just to provide financially, it's to provide people. And so as a church, there are those times where we send out and we pray, and there's other times where it might be, you're the one going, where you're the one that has the opportunity. Spring Lake, we have opportunity regularly to give, to support local as well as global opportunities. Just recently, we sent out Mark and Megan music. If you remember, Mark was here serving for six months as they prepare to go to London. Some of our newest missionaries going to London where only 5% there claim to be followers of Jesus. It's an opportunity to have global impact for the cause of Christ. Last week, you saw a video about an opportunity happening in March 
to go to a community in Paradise, California that has been devastated by fires where everything has been wiped out, where the pastor on the video was talking about the percentage of people in his church that lost everything. And there's an opportunity not only for us as a church to pray about that, to provide for that, but to send a team to go there at the end of March to minister and to be part of the rebuilding. And that opportunity could include you. You could be a part of that. There's an informational meeting tomorrow night happening on Zoom at 6.30. You can register for that today on the website if you're like, hey, I wanna, I wanna know what that entails. You don't have to have experience. It's just something if God has laid on your heart, if you're interested, be a part, go. See, we see these opportunities not only to give, not just of our finances, but of our time and of our very lives. This is the work of the church. And when it comes to the will of God, sometimes there's confusion. Have you ever found yourself wondering like, well, I just don't know what God's will is. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And because there's always been all these questions, you've never done anything. Because I don't want to get it wrong. Right? I, I, I don't want to do something I'm not supposed to do. And so God's will just seems so mysterious to us. Like, man, it's just trying to nail that one spot. So we're right in the middle of God's will. Not like kind of outside, right in the middle. Right? But look at the example that we see from Paul. That it's not just about always knowing. Sometimes in following Jesus, there is this commitment through uncertainty doesn't always mean that we, that we see clearly, but understanding that following Jesus is fluid. Sometimes it seems that there's this opportunity that is a really good option for us, but the door is closed. It's not necessarily game over, it's just a redirection. The key is not to get too keyed up on or too focused on following our own dreams, our own sense of what God would have us do because that can change. Look at what Paul says in verse five. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you for I will be going through Macedonia. Now look, perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. See, the commitment is a commitment to following Jesus wherever Jesus leads. Remember that our perspective of what is good and what God says is best are very different. For Paul, seeing opposition was not necessarily the sign of a closed door, right? Sometimes we're like, man, people don't like it, so I better not do that. Paul's like, man, there's this incredible opportunity. There's this incredible opportunity for the gospel, and there's a lot of people that are against me for doing this. But he's looking at the open door. Sometimes there is this clear direction, and yet the going can be very difficult. The key to submitting our, is to submitting our plans to God and being open to where he leads. That means for us being humble, being dependent, being prayerful can also involve the wisdom of other believers. I know for me personally, countless times over my life where people have spoken into my life if I, as I have sought their wisdom, their, their prayers, and where they have been a, a godly influence in my life. Paul also realizes that sometimes there are things that he might really like and prefer that may not be God's will. You ever have that happen? I mean, isn't that weird to think? There's something that you could want so bad, but it's not God's will. Something that might seem so good, and yet it's not God's will. Look at how he approaches this conversation with Apollos. Remember, Apollos was a gifted teacher as well. And Paul says, man, I really wanted Apollos to come to you. 
I really thought it would be a good opportunity for Apollos to come and minister to you. Look at what he says in verse 12. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. So in other words, there's a sense, strongly urging, Paul kind of pleading, Paul trying to convince Apollos. What's Apollos' reaction? He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. A reminder that sometimes we might see things and it looks so good, but it's not going to work out. In this situation, from Paul's perspective, it made sense. From Apollos, he was doing a different work that he could not get away from. It wasn't that Apollos was just making an excuse, like, Paul, I'm so sorry, I have to do my hair Friday night. I, I, can't, I can't go to Corinth. No, Apollos was doing other work, but Paul doesn't throw him under the bus and say, you know what? That schmuck Apollos, no, he says, our, our brother Apollos, it's not going to work out for him right now as much as I want him to go, but he's going he's gonna to be there when he has the opportunity. The key is open hands. God, where are you leading? There are things that we hold very tightly to. What is most important to hold tightly to is, God, I, I just want to follow you, not, not, my, not my dreams, not my desires, but to be open-handed with those things. God, what, it is, what is it that you are desiring for us? So throughout this passage, throughout this chapter, there are various examples that we could be looking at, various people that could be mentioned, but we don't have time. We're gonna, we're gonna keep moving on this morning. And so the second thing that we see to commit to this morning is commit to the battle plan, verses 13 through 14. He says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. In other words, it's not just an idea, it's godly instruction, it's a posture we're to have in navigating life. Those things that we're to be committed to, Last week, we saw Aaron Rodgers was committed to throwing the ball to Devontae Adams. <laughs> Every single time, <laughs> without fail, without fail. And it cost us, right? And there are things that we need to learn. What are those things that we need to commit to where it's like, okay, I need to redirect, I need a plan B, and what are these things that we say, no, every time, this is it. This is what we're committed to. And this is one of those moments where this is what we commit to. What we're seeing in verses 13 through 14, this commitment that we're to have as followers of Jesus that we're not to lose sight of, be on your guard. Paul isn't talking about being wary of politics. Look out for conspiracies. Look out for what's happening around you. Be on your guard. Watch your own way of thinking, your mindset. Be careful of embracing anything that is contrary to what God desires of us. Guard yourself against false teaching. Guard yourself against temptation. Guard yourself against false ways of thinking. In other words, guard yourself against lies. Guard yourself against the one who would seek to kill and destroy. Live in such a way that you are ready. That if you're ready to see Jesus today, you're not surprised. Be on your guard. The danger for us as followers of Jesus today is being our, on our guard against the wrong things. Not wanting to be fooled by news. But we're not being on guard with our hearts. We're not being on guard with what Christ has for us. Stand firm in the faith. Don't be swayed by culture. Don't be swayed by circumstances. Don't lose focus. Dive deep into the hope we have in Christ. We look to Jesus as the one who has overcome our sin, as the one who has set us free and the one who has given us hope beyond the grave. Jesus, who has taken on our biggest enemies, and we have victory in him. Don't lose sight of that. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't base your standing on where you're at. Don't base your identity on our, on our culture, on what society says about you, on your circumstances or the winds of change. Base it on Christ. Stand 
firm. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Remember when David faced Goliath, all of the army of Israel stood back. No one wanted to take, take on Goliath. David goes out there and says, you know what? God's going to have the victory. And he takes out Goliath, chops off his head. And what happens at that moment? All of these guys who had been so fearful now have this brave heart moment. Right? Goliath, the giant, has been destroyed, and they all go charging out on the battlefield. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says, Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the, Ch the Sherem Road to Gath and Ekron. These men who were so fearful to get into the fight, once Goliath was destroyed, they went all out. You see, for us, we're not David, Okay. Jesus was David. Jesus is David. Jesus is the one that took on the giant that we cannot defeat. Jesus defeated sin. Jesus defeated the grave. And so with that, because the greatest enemy has been destroyed, because Satan is being crushed, because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, be courageous. Be strong. Let's go. Right? Get out there. What have we to fear? If we die, we're better off. Be strong. Be courageous. The enemy has been destroyed. And then do everything in love. It's not a call from Paul to do a lot of beating on our chest. Sometimes we think, yeah, be courageous. Be a manly man. You know, no, it's not about chest bumping because we know that as you get older, you try to stick out your chest, you, you pull something, you know? It's like, man, can't do that anymore. It's not called to be about a bunch of chest bumping, being manly men. It's about being courageous as men and women because our God has overcome. And it's not about being brave and courageous or being loving. Which one should I be? It's not either or. It's doing everything in love. Otherwise, we get a false idea of what courage looks like. It's to be done in love, love for God and love for one another. We're to be both. See, the instruction that we have here for the Corinthians is just as important for us today. To be reminded of these incredible truths, to be committed to this plan that he's talking about right here. To be on guard to be courageous, to be strong. See, if we don't commit to the plan, we end up looking like the world. If we look like the world, we lose sight of the hope of Christ. If we lose sight of the hope of Christ, we have no message to share worth anything with the world because we look no different. If we don't commit to the plan, we're just spinning our wheels. However, staying faithful, because God is faithful to us, staying grounded because it's our only hope and what Jesus has done for us, being courageous because Jesus has overcome, acting in love because God has poured out his love on us freely and every day. There's not one moment where we are without the love of God. There's not one moment where God says, you know what, I don't, I don't love you as much as I did yesterday. Every single day, God's mercies are new for you. You have been set free. You've been given an incredible hope in Jesus, a, a reason to be courageous. And that's why we're here. Because this God is worthy of all that we are. So I just want to close with Paul's words as he wrapped this up with the Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Think about that. As a follower of Christ, you will not be without that grace. There's not one moment you'll be without that grace. So cling to him, surrender to him, follow him, live for him, give your all for him because none of it, none of it is wasted. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that you give us. Thank you for the heart that you have displayed for us in sending 
Jesus to rescue us. And God, it's so easy for us to get distracted. It's so easy for our perspectives to get skewed. God, we can even start out the morning really well and by afternoon, we've just gone off the rails. So God, we just cry out that we need you. So would you help us to surrender? Would you just continually transform the way that we think so that our lives would be lived in honor of you? Help us to be strong in you. Help us to be courageous in you, to do everything out of love for you and out of love for one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.